thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I, I appreciate so many people coming out to uh, to uh, listen to chocolate and uh, learn li learn a little bit about the science of chocolate. So um, I thought we'd start off and uh, start off with two very simple concepts: uh, chocolate and cocoa comes from a tree, and uh, when you're consuming a chocolate bar, what you should be eating are the fermented, roasted, and ground seeds of Theobroma cacao, the cocoa tree. And that's where Theo chocolate gets its name. Uh, it comes from Theobroma cacao, the Latin name for the chocolate tree. And it's there to remind you of what the origins of your food are and what the origins of, uh, of real chocolate is. And uh, I don't recommend you eat quite as much chocolate as the person on the right, but uh, she obviously likes her chocolate bar. And what I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight is uh, what's in chocolate and what makes people want to do that. So I thought we'd, uh, we'd cover that and that'd be a fun topic. So uh, we start with cocoa beans. And for those of you that have uh, not seen cocoa beans before, here, here are cocoa beans. This is a, uh, uh, a bowl full of some very nice uh, Costa Rican cocoa beans. And these are the seeds out of the uh, cocoa pod, out of the tree that I showed you on the previous slide. And uh, at Theo Chocolate, we have the tools, if you'll pardon the pun, <laughs> to uh, take the cocoa beans and turn them from cocoa beans into something that you might recognize, which is finished chocolate, and on the right-hand side, some of our delicious confections. And for those of you that are actually in the audience tonight, and uh, you may be tasting some of these as they're passed around, I hope there's enough for everyone to go around. And for those of you that are on the web, I apologize. We are working on TheoVision and trying to make a way to share the chocolate, but it will take us a little bit longer. So uh, if, you, if you haven't had a chance to uh, come and see Theo Chocolate, uh, we're located in Seattle's Fremont neighborhood in an old trolley barn, and we're what's called a bean-to-bar chocolate maker. That means we take cocoa beans and we go all the way through to the finished chocolate bar, and that's not a very common thing to do. There are about maybe 12 to 14 companies in the whole of the US that actually do this, and most of those companies are fairly large. There's only a small handful of artisan chocolate makers that go through the whole process, starting with cocoa beans. Uh, we like organic uh, uh, types of cocoa, so nearly all of our products are organic certified. And we also like fair trade certified chocolate, and that's one of the, one of the, one of the more problematic issues with, uh, with chocolate and, and the cocoa industry, is, uh, uh, is the use of fair, uh, fair labor practices. So uh, we have fair trade chocolate, and we make chocolate bars and confections. Confections are the delicious little filled things that are going around the room. And we use the highest quality ingredients. And you can see, if you take the tour, you can see all sorts of uh, chocolate making equipment and, and various parts of, uh, of the factory. So what I talk about tonight, I'm going to cover a quick history of chocolate. I think like all of these things, history is useful. It gives you perspective, understand how we got here in the first place. Then we're going to talk about proper chocolate. We're not going to talk about some, some strange, cheap nonsense. We're going to talk about proper chocolate tonight. <laughs> and uh, we're also going to talk about chocolate. What's in it? What's in real chocolate? Assuming we have real chocolate, what's in it? And again, to the right there, that's a picture of Theobroma cacao. Those are the cocoa pods growing very close to the, uh, to the trunk of the tree. And it's the seeds of these pods that you're eating when you eat chocolate. Okay, so cocoa is a foodstuff. It has survived many civilizations. It has outlasted at least four. So currently to date, Olmec, Maya, Toltec, and Aztec. Uh, first evidence of cocoa drinks goes back to 1340 BC. So this is, this is a, a, an old comestible. Um, to put a little more history on it, about so 1502, so 3,000 years later, Columbus lands in Nicaragua on his way to India, as you would do, uh, there wasn't any Panama Canal in those days, so he sort of got somewhat off course, I would say. And uh, he discovers the Aztec, uh, cons uh, Aztec culture consuming cocoa drinks and uh, using cocoa beans as currency. So, so these were being used as currency, and uh, four cocoa beans is a rabbit, ten cocoa beans is the services of a prostitute, and 100 cocoa beans a human slave. So uh, there's, as you can tell, quite a lot of money here in this pot. Um, in 1520, Hernando Cortes, a very famous Spanish explorer, sets up a plantation and brings cocoa to Spain with the very rational idea that what he's going to do is cultivate money on trees. Um, you know, logically, the Aztecs were using it as a currency. He thought he could grow it. Well, it's an interesting idea. It didn't really work out. 
Anyway, so as you can tell, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be able to stand in front of you here uh, uh, with my somewhat British accent. And I'll remind you that in the birthplace where, where, I, uh, where I was born, uh, uh, that the British invented chocolate. And, and it was a gentleman by the name of Joseph Fry that took the first chocolate uh, 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 bar and developed a first chocolate bar rather than making chocolate uh, from a frothy drink. So chocolate had originally been a, a foamy sort of drink, essentially made by crushing up these cocoa beans. Uh, imagine this in a beer mug and then letting the thing ferment and consuming that as a drink. And so Mr. Joseph Fry uh, decided that instead it would be fun if instead of it being a liquid and sloshing all over the place, if you could actually make this stuff as a solid material. And so he developed the first chocolate bar. Now, of course, it wasn't until 1879, so uh, quite a few years later, that a Swiss gentleman by the name of Rudolf Lindt, sound familiar, uh, finally invents chocolate properly that actually tastes good. So the Brits came up with it. Very good innovators, as always. The taste of the chocolate, not so good. Uh, nice form factor, not quite executed perfectly. So leave it to the Swiss to finish things off. So that's the story of, of chocolate from, uh, from 1340 BC. And bear in mind, this is a very, very old foodstuff. So 1340 BC, that's 113 generations ago. This is how old chocolate is. So it's a staggeringly old foodstuff. Fascinating material. So what are we up to these days? Uh, what, is, what does modern chocolate look like these days? Well, people consume a lot of it. Uh, they haven't actually taken to bathing in chocolate yet, but I think we're almost there. So, so the Swiss consume a staggering 25 pounds per year of chocolate, uh, an interesting legacy of Rudolf Lindt from 1879. And the US is not that far behind it with, uh, with 12 pounds per year of chocolate. So people consume quite a lot of chocolate when, they, when they're given the chance. And uh, currently the industry is uh, quite large. It's about 3.4 million tons of cocoa is harvested every year. So this isn't, uh, this isn't such a small thing. Chocolate has sort of grown from being this interesting sort of niche industry into something quite large. So what about cocoa in the US? Well, there, there is actually very, very, very small amounts of cocoa grown in Hawaii. Uh, it's, a, it's a tropical plant. It likes to grow within about 20 degrees of the equator where it's hot and humid and there's lots of snakes on the ground. So um, in general, uh, there's, not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of cocoa grown in the United States. But for every $1 of cocoa that's imported, $1 to $2 worth of other ingredients, US-based ingredients, are used. And so uh, one and a half million tons of sugar uh, are used, 650 million pounds of milk, and 25% of all US peanuts end up in chocolate. It's a, a fascinating statistic. <laughs> so chocolate, although it's this fascinating uh, equatorial crop, has a lot of influence on the US. OK, so enough with the economics lesson. Uh, uh, very, very interesting, fascinating numbers. I'm going to teach, teach you a little bit about chocolate, how it's made, and some of the processes that are used in chocolate, some of the more traditional processes, but also to talk a little bit about some of the more modern ways that people have ended up processing chocolate and why they've gone down these routes. OK, so this is how chocolate making uh, is done in a relatively traditional manner. Uh, at the cocoa farm, so somewhere warm and tropical, uh, think uh, usually West Africa, Ghana, uh, maybe it's Costa Rica, uh, maybe it's Ecuador. The cocoa is grown, the pods are harvested manually, and the seeds are scooped out of the pods. And they scoop the seeds out and they're in this la uh, sort of white sugary mucilage. And because we're in an equatorial environment, practically everything rots instantaneously down there. So the material will start fermenting very, very rapidly. And what we're interested in doing is fermenting these cocoa seeds and taking them from a sort of a, a raw seed state which if you can imagine is about the size of a kidney bean and also bright purple in the middle, taking them all the way from that sort of state to something that looks a little bit more like the coffee bean on the inside of it, except it's the size of a large almond. And if that's not confusing, I don't know what is. So, so anyway, just imagine this, this material here being fermented in, 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 in uh, large boxes. And this is the fermentation process of cacao. It's very, very complex. It goes through at least three major microbial steps from yeast to lactic acid to acetic acid bacteria. 
Uh, fermentation is not like um, Anheuser-Busch. Uh, we don't do this in large stainless steel vats. This is done locally at the farms. It's done in wooden boxes or wrapped, in this case, wrapped up in banana leaves. It's quite low tech. And it's quite an interesting sort of uh, uh, specialized knowledge to know how to ferment cocoa, uh, cocoa beans. So it's much less in industrialized. And that's interesting because a lot of the fermentation, a lot of the handling of cocoa is done uh, on smallholder farms or in small co-ops. Cocoa is not really a sort of mass-produced agricultural product. It tends to be the product of small, small uh, uh, farms or small groups working together. So when we get the cocoa beans, they arrive to us in this state. They've been fermented and then dried and then put in jute sacks, transported to us over a very long way on a very slow boat. And uh, we'll take these beans and we'll roast them. And you can see on the left-hand side there, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a roaster. And uh, ours is a bit of a museum piece. It looks like it belongs in the Smithsonian. It needs to go back to the Smithsonian. And um, uh, on the other side is a machine that removes the, the woody shell. So if you look at these, these beans and you sort of rub them in your hands, you'll see that there's actually a woody shell uh, that is uh, surrounding the cocoa bean. And uh, we want to get rid of that. That, that. that bit's wood. You don't want to eat that. Just like you don't want to eat potpourri, you don't want to eat that piece. So, <laughs> so uh, we want to remove that, that outer piece. And then what we want to do is we want to grind uh, the cocoa pieces, uh, what are called the cocoa nib. Think of, think of it like a pencil nib or something like that, the pieces that are inside the cocoa shell. We want to grind those very, very finely. And then we want to mix them with some sugar. And then we want to grind that again. And there's lots and lots of grinding in chocolate making, which is one of the reasons why it took almost 3,000 years for chocolate to become a solid object. Prior to that, there just wasn't the technology for grinding chocolate with that sort of level of precision and that amount of energy. You needed at least a steam engine, uh, if not an electric motor. So that really is why the Swiss came up with all of this and you know, did, did some very nice fancy engineering. But of course, it was the British that started it off with a bit of innovation, as usual, but ran out of money. <laughs> so uh, we grind the cocoa beans and sugar. Now we've got this big sort of interesting slurry of cocoa beans and sugar. And this is where the Swiss invention came in. So up until this point, we can actually take this slurry of cocoa beans and sugar, grind it very, very finely, pour it into a mold, and we actually have a chocolate bar. The problem is, is that the fermentation acids, the acids left over from that fermentation I mentioned where the cocoa beans are fermented, have a very strong taste, uh, primarily vinegar, about 98% acetic acid. And so this vinegary taste permeates the whole chocolate bar, and it tastes pretty revolting. Um, and, and that was British chocolate. That was Joseph, Joseph Fry's contribution. And it wasn't until Rudolf Lindt came along that he decided that wouldn't it be better just to slow cook the darn thing and basically take it up to high temperature, stir it around a lot, and you can basically mature that flavor from this acidic sort of, think of salad dressing mixed with chocolate. Does that taste? That doesn't sound appetizing, does it? Think of salad dressing mixed with chocolate, and you could take that material, and by slow cooking it, you can produce something that's very, very familiar, and that is the taste of chocolate as we know it today. And then finally, we need to temper the chocolate. Um, we need to set the crystal uh, state of chocolate. Chocolate actually has a crystal state. Uh, the fat molecules in it uh, require a certain, a certain uh, arrangement. Otherwise, the chocolate looks like it does after it is melted in your car and been reset in your fridge. The, the material separates. It doesn't look very good. So we have to set the crystal state. And then we pour the chocolate into molds, and then we do the um, Lucy thing, whatever that American connotation is, the, the, the conveyor belt with them all coming off the end where you try and eat them all. <laughs> yes, so we do that. Um, and then we wrap the chocolate bars, and, and there we go, finished, finished chocolate. Now, there are cheaper ways to make chocolate, and uh, we choose to do it the sort of the old school way. And some of this is... Uh, personal choice. Some of this was uh, we didn't have the money for the big fancy equipment, so we just sort of got started and, and built uh, what we thought was a fun thing to do in terms of uh, building an interesting company. And a lot of people expeller press uh, chocolate and cocoa. So they'll take a, one of these beans and they'll crush it at about 4,000 pounds per square inch, and you can separate the cocoa butter. Uh, it's about 50% cocoa butter. You can separate the oil out of this by, by high hydraulic pressure. And the crushed remains uh, can be turned into cocoa powder. That's why when you look around, you'll see lots of cocoa powder used in everything because it's the cheap crushed remains of the cocoa beans. So we don't do that. We actually take this material, 
we, we grind it up and we use the whole thing. We don't separate the butter and the powder. So that's one thing that's commonly done in the chocolate industry. The next thing that's done is something called Dutch processing. And again, this was somewhere back in the, in the 1800s, and this was some Dutch dude, I can't remember his name. Um, and uh, he decided that it would be a lot quicker than doing uh, Rudolf Lint's slow cooking method. What he'd do is just chuck some chemicals in there. And uh, uh, he found a quick way of uh, getting rid of the fermentation acids. And those fermentation acids can be removed by alkalization, by treating with a little bit of alkali, because the fermentation acid is acetic acid. The third thing that's become very, imp uh, very, very popular, way too popular, I would say, it's a, it's a trend that's uh, far more popular than Lady Gaga, uh, is, the, is, is the use of emulsifiers. And uh, a lot of people are using soy products in practically everything. Uh, I know we make a lot of the stuff, uh, and that, that's great. I'm excited about that, but it doesn't belong in everything. Uh, and so uh, the, the drive to use... Um, uh, polar lipids and, and charged fat molecules, such as soy lecithin, uh, essentially as a food soap, have really driven the use of lots of food additives in chocolate. And a lot of people are used to it. So many people, in fact, have consumed chocolate with soy lecithin that it has become the norm. So people are used to a creamy taste. And if you eat a cheap chocolate bar, that creamy taste is the soy lecithin. It's not, it's not coming from the cocoa or the chocolate. And then there's use of fillers. This is the really nasty stuff. Lactose whey, non-cocoa butter fats. There was a big push a few years ago to, to replace the cocoa butter uh, uh, in chocolate with all sorts of other oils and nasty stuff and you know all that sort of miserable big food stuff. So those are things that you shouldn't do with your food. As your mother said, don't play with your food. <laughs> so why are they doing it? Well, they're doing it because the cocoa prices have gone crazy. So this is, this is what's happened to cocoa prices uh, over the last few years. And this is the price per ton on the left-hand side. So you can see it's about uh, well, 15, 1,600 bucks a ton. And now all of a sudden it's 3,500 bucks a ton. And if you've made your business selling little eight cent chocolate bars or selling chocolate very, very cheap, you have a big problem right now. And that's one of the reasons why we've seen some of these acquisitions, why Cadbury's, you're maybe not so British, but I'm British, and it was one of our big, big British chocolate makers, was bought by Kraft Foods. Uh, one of the reasons why they're having a hard time is there's been a big change in their business model because all of a sudden cocoa prices have gone crazy. Um, so it, you have two choices. If you, if you have a business based on making lots of chocolate and sort of bringing it to the masses at the lowest possible cost, then you have a business problem. Or you can take the other approach, which is to dilute out the chocolate and make it into something else. So I bring you the American approach to the business, <laughs> which, is, which is this, um, which is very colorful. It looks like something out of the Fred Flintstone's, uh, Fred Flintstone movie. And on the right-hand side, you can see lots of different ingredients. And this may appeal to you if you like drinking seaweed products and various other things like that. But, but you can see what's happening. What's happening is the cocoa prices are high, Therefore, people put interesting things in the food, and therefore, we end up with chocolate drinks that aren't quite as chocolatey as they could be. So that's, that's, that's how food sort of changes. And what I find fascinating about food as a science person is how quickly food has changed. In the last 30 years, we've seen tremendous changes in food. So in the US, we've seen what I would sort of regard as this interesting sort of devolution in foodstuffs, and it's now that we're just starting to see a resurgence of organic food Okay, and there's been these big changes where it actually used to be pretty healthy and wholesome 30 years ago. Everything became very, very processed and very scary, and now there's a sort of little resurgence of organic food. And in the UK, the good news is the food got better, thankfully. I mean, it was pretty awful 30 years ago, and now the food's marginally better. So, I mean, there is, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a silver lining in that cloud. Okay, so real chocolate, just to get on my uh, high horse here. So real chocolate should consist of dark chocolate, ground fermented roasted cocoa beans, sugar, a touch of cocoa butter maybe. Real milk chocolate, it's very simple. Cocoa beans, sugar, cocoa butter, milk powder. Four ingredients, and that's in milk chocolate. Dark chocolate basically should be three or four at most. Uh, the, the stuff at the bottom, mocklet, is a name that I didn't coin, but lots of other people have used. And it sort of describes this sort of cheap brown pseudo chocolate, and you can see my, my ranting under there, and I've, I've crossed it all out, so it's not too, not, not too crazy. But um, basically, all sorts of food-like things that look a little bit like chocolate, but have got a little bit confused along the way. So, assuming I'm eating real chocolate, 
and not some slimy brown mockolate uh, imposter. Why is chocolate so mysterious and what is actually in chocolate? Let's talk a little bit about the chemistry of chocolate and what it does to you. Because if you eat lots and lots of real chocolate, it does actually have some interesting effects on people. So let's talk about the effects of chocolate on the human. <laughs> so there are some interesting effects. Some people get quite a buzz off chocolate, uh, especially people who, who don't consume caffeine. If they're very caffeine sensitive, they often have, have uh, quite a strong response to chocolate. Chocolate has a very, interesting, uh, a very interesting molecule in it called theobromine, very similar to theobroma cacao. And uh, theobromine is related to caffeine. It's not the same molecule. Uh, it's not harmful, it doesn't, it, it, it's, and it's not scary. This is actually a breakdown product that's normally generated within the human liver if you consume caffeine. So it's an intermediary product, but it exists in this state in cocoa. And it, there's an awful lot of it in chocolate, huge quantities. So when you consume a chocolate bar, you get a good little dose of theobromine. And the good news is it's not a big sort of fast caffeine rush. It's a nice, pleasant, sort of um, slightly uplifting sort of little buzz. And uh, so there's theobromine in chocolate. It's naturally occurring, nothing, nothing unusual or strange. There's lots of, uh, lots of uh, caffeine in, in various foodstuffs. And, and theobromine is the, uh, is, the, is the stimulant that's in chocolate. And the other thing that's in chocolate is actually definitely good for you. Uh, there's an antioxidant in chocolate. In fact, there's a number of different classes. They have very fascinating names, specifically epicatechin and procyanid and flavanols. Um, and uh, they, they have the structure below, which is a little multi-ring structure, uh, a multi-ring structure with lots of hydroxyl groups hanging off it. And there's an awful lot of this in chocolate. And this material is quite a potent antioxidant and has gathered a lot of, uh, of interest in the scientific press. And there's been about two or three hundred different scientific articles, um, at least at least 50, which are pretty, probably pretty decent. Uh, looking at the effects of these particular class of molecules on human health. And what they do is they get rid of free radicals. And uh, this isn't a reference to any uh, ideological group. This is a reference to a specific oxygen molecule where uh, an electron has, has, uh, has, has gone somewhat astray. And lots of things generate free radicals around, uh, around us. Uh, ionizing radiation, UV light, uh, Pollution, smoking, our own uh, energy processes create free radicals. There's lots of free radicals in biology. Uh, basically, if you breathe oxygen, you're at risk of having a, 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 you know, an attack by a free radical. So uh, you know, the, the, the solution is clear. If you don't want free radicals, stop breathing. Um, and the problem here is that these free radicals attack your DNA, and then bad things happen, and we get, we get very, very ill from that. And so we're actually able to take some of the free radicals into our bodies through chocolate. We're meant to eat lots of fre fresh, healthy vegetables, but a lot of us don't do that. Uh, but you can actually absorb a fair amount of free radicals out of dark chocolate. Dark chocolate's got a lot of them. Milk chocolate is very, very simple. All that's happening is the material is being basically diluted. Milk chocolate's got less. Dutch chocolate, remember that chemical treatment? That, that really knocks that stuff on the head. They're alkali sensitive, so they get broken down. And then mockolet, I have no idea why anyone would eat that, but if you wish to visit your 7-Eleven, you can find that material. Uh, and, and then very, very sadly, white chocolate, I don't care how organic or gorgeous it is, it really has a very low antioxidant level, and, and it's a lovely, creamy butter fat bar, uh, but really it's not, it's not really chocolate, guys. But, but it is good, I'll, I'll give it that. So. So, so antioxidants, lots of them in dark chocolate. And the other fun thing about antioxidants is they contribute to the flavor. And this rather complicated diagram here uh, is a uh, flavor gram, and it indicates in cocoa nibs, remember these things here where we took these cocoa beans and we, we roast them and then we take the pieces from the inside. The flavors uh, that are produced in your mouth from the cocoa nibs are generated by anti antioxidants. So if you look in the bottom left of the diagram in the purple area, you'll see that the astringent flavors, so bitter and astringent flavors are somewhat related, you'll see that the astringent flavors are generated by epicatechin, catechin, procyanidin. So the antioxidants in chocolate contribute to the flavor. If you look in the, uh, the sort of the dark blue area at the very top at 12 o'clock, you'll see that theobromine and even caffeine contribute to the flavor. And this is part of the human survival mechanism. Humans are attuned to taste their food 
And as long as we haven't got too sort of far off the path where we've developed bad habits and we've started eating very, very unhealthy things and then identifying those as being good for us, which is where things go horribly wrong, there is actually a, a way that we can actually taste these things in the food. So if you taste very, very dark chocolate, you'll experience some of these. The antioxidants are slightly mouth drying. There's, a, there's an astringency, a mouth drying effect that they have when you put this, uh, put, your, put this on your tongue. And it almost, if you could imagine a little bit more of that, it would be almost be medicinal. And there's a sort of a, an old, there's an old evolutionary process happening there, telling us about what we're eating. So what you're eating, and assuming we haven't sort of all got carried away with the fat and the salt and what have you, what you're eating is, is, is very much uh, 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 being communicated to you by your body, and it's trying to tell you about some of the nutritional value of what you're snacking on. Right, so what about uh, clinical studies? Well, people have taken chocolate, and this is a very, very interesting study. It's been uh, touted uh, 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 around the press and was received a lot of attention, but it's quite important. They took uh, uh, 44 adults, um, and uh, I know we have a, a varied crowd here, so uh, 56 to 73, uh, they either old, middle-aged, or young, depending on your, on your point of view. And um, <laughs> these people were fed only six grams of dark chocolate a day. Six grams is a, is, is a piece about, about this big. It's a very, very small piece of dark chocolate. And uh, they were fed either six grams of dark chocolate, or six grams of white chocolate, that's 30 kilocalories, that's nothing, that's, that's, that's a minimal calorific intake. They were, they were force-fed chocolate for 18 weeks. <laughs> I can imagine this is this a very difficult study. And, uh, and uh, what they actually noticed is that there was a measurable uh, drop in blood pressure in the group that consumed the dark chocolate of around two to three millimeters of mercury, which is, which is in terms of blood pressure measurement, that's a, a meaningful drop. That's something that you might get if you were taking a, some sort of heavyweight pharmaceutical. And in the group that snacked on the white chocolate, they, they had no effect at all. So there was an interesting uh, drop in blood pressure associated with very, very small quantities of dark chocolate. So you don't actually have to eat a lot of this stuff to get a clinical effect. And chocolate has lots of interesting effects. That's not the only one. It's also an anti-inflammatory. It's quite a potent anti-inflammatory. It has aspirin-like properties. Um, and very, very perversely, something you might not expect, is that chocolate also uh, is quite an eff uh, effective inhibitor of tooth decay. The sugar in chocolate isn't. Yeah, that's the other way around. <laughs> but the chocolate is an inhibitor of tooth decay. Okay, so really the story about chocolate becomes not about the chocolate per se. You can come to the factory and there's some times when you can taste 100% uh, cacao, ground cacao, which is really awesome stuff. It's about what you put with the chocolate that changes, that changes really the, uh, the effect of chocolate on the body. Okay, so I hope I've given you a little bit of a taste of chocolate. I was asked to keep this short, so I'll keep this very, very brief. And uh, I'll finish with a, a, a summary slide and say, so yes, there are interesting things in chocolate. Chocolate does contain bioactive compounds, and there are more to discover. We believe that there's lots more secrets left in chocolate, despite the fact that we've been working on it with very modern analysis tools for over 20 or 30 years. Antioxidants are part of the flavor of chocolate, so you can taste what you eat and you can tell if it's good or not. The effects of physiology are good for you and they're tangible. Uh, come by the factory and we'll show you all sorts of interesting things where you can actually uh, feel the effects of chocolate. And eating loads of unhealthy rubbish with mystery ingredients and having no idea of where your food comes from is silly. <laughs> and I'll finish on that note and thank you very much. True that the chemical reaction in your brain that you get from eating chocolate is the same as when you fall in love? And how does that work? I think the mi oh oh no down the microphone works unfortunately I'm going to have to come up with an answer, um, uh, maybe. <laughs> I think that's quite a difficult answer. I think the 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 neurochemistry of chocolate is actually not that well understood. So uh, there are some very interesting uh, there are some very interesting studies on chocolate, and there is a lot of work that is remaining to be done. Uh, you have to think about the history of chocolate. Maybe that can uh, help illuminate the answer. So, so back in the 1500s, Hernando Cortez goes, goes uh, to, the, to the Yucatan Peninsula 
and he's seeing people, con uh, basically the Aztec elite, consuming large amounts of a cocoa beverage and using that to go on very, very long marches and carry out quite brutal military campaigns where they basically subvert the population and then get them to grow cocoa, which they then use a f as a form of currency. A fascinating piece of vile and brutal history, but it tells you that there was something very interesting in that chocolate. One of them was likely a source of calories, so they were probably getting some sort of calorific intake. But it also suggests that cocoa drinks are not the same as a chocolate bar. And there's two things that are different. One is a cocoa drink, you're not tending, think about it this way, and, and slightly revolting, but an equatorial crop that, that uh, is also fermented and roasted and consumed um, uh, is normally ground up into a fi a fine, a fine particles and we pour water through it. That equatorial crop is called coffee and it's very, very popular. And in the case of cocoa, what we're doing is we're consuming the grounds, okay? We're consuming the ground material. If you think about what the Aztecs were doing, what they were consuming is they were consuming an extract of chocolate, which is quite a different thing. Um, in our studies, when we've looked at this, and this is some, something that we, we sell, but we, we sort of looked at this in some, some detail, what we've seen is that there's a very big difference in the chemistry of chocolate when it's a, when it's a drink versus when it's a chocolate bar. And that's probably because the, the cocoa butter and possibly some other things are impeding the uptake of some of these things. So there's a lot more to be discovered on chocolate, and I think it will make it a little bit easier if we focus on, on some of those things that, un that tell us about, uh, about what's really going on. So I can tell you we have fabulous parties um, <laughs> at Theo, uh, which, which do suggest that, um, that uh, uh, those, those, those types of chemical uh, pathways are activated, but I can't exactly tell you what and how. Was that evasive enough for you? I think it was. <laughs> can you, uh, yeah, I'm behind the screen, you can't see me. A mystery um, person. Can you explain or dispel the myth about chocolate being an aphrodisiac? Ah. Again, I think, I think that depends on how you consume your chocolate. So I think, I, think <laughs> I, 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 I have a number of opinions. So firstly, you, you need to remember not to eat some, some cheap masquerading mocklet material that's not really chocolate. Um, uh, it would help if it was high cocoa content chocolate. I think um, there are some, some interesting things that happen with chocolate. Uh, my opinion is that people have got lost and they're, and they're trying to c consume uh, chocolate-like objects looking for that, that sort of elusive aphrodisia and then they're not going to find it because they're consuming something that is, that is, it is a long way away from what people originally observed. So, so I think you have to think about what is it I'm consuming and is that really chocolate? And if that is really chocolate, what sort of effect is it having on me? And then, <coughs> to add a little more complexity to it, the different origins of chocolate have different effects and the state of that chocolate also have different effects. So if you consume, for instance, fresh, freshly roasted cocoa nibs, they have a different effect on you than consuming uh, a very finely ground, very rich dark chocolate, you know, or 100% chocolate, for instance. So it depends on what you eat. And sort of, I would say, watch this space. I'll say that very uh, mysteriously. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll just answer that one. Uh, somebody just over here just asked, what if the nibs are roasted or not roasted? That is a very important question. So, so th the roasting p chemistry uh, is very, very important. During the roasting process, there are some chemistry that occurs during the fermentation, but a lot of the chemistry occurs during the roasting and we see a conversion of some of these small critical molecules that have an effect on the, on the human mind. Um, uh, uh, being generated in some of these steps of roasting. So roasting is a very, very important part of it. It's where the, the sugar molecules uh, combine with some of the proteins uh, uh, and combine with the amino acids in the, uh, uh, in the cocoa bean. And it's these sugar amino acid combinations that are quite potent and they have interesting effects on you. And it's very, very complicated. Nobody has really got to the bottom of it. And the reason being is that most of the chemistry, when they looked at this type of chemistry, was done in pure sort of test tubes. But in this case, when we're, doing, when we're roasting a cocoa nib, we've also got a lot of fat there. And that fat also makes the chemistry more complex to understand. And in 1997, there was a fabulous article by a, 
by a Harvard um, researcher where they identified the presence of something called anandamide, which is a, 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 a mind-active chemical. It's, a, it's an interesting um, molecule that's definitely s almost considered to be, a, uh, considered to be a, 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 an illicit drug. It's sort of in that category of, of uh, mental modulators. And uh, this material was found in chocolate, and then it was sort of rebutted uh, and sort of poo-pooed uh, as a sort of medical community all climbed on top of it and didn't like it, probably because it didn't fit with their worldview. Um, but the interesting thing with that study was when they rebutted it, what they were doing was they were feeding the pure chemical back to, in that case, rats. I don't know why they didn't just use humans. They probably would have enjoyed it more. Um, but but uh, they, they fed it back to rats, and the problem is is that they've lost... The, the context, they've lost the rest of the pharma, you know, the, the pharmacokinetic context for what they were feeding back to the rats. So chocolate is not only this unusual m material and mixture with interest in chemistry, but it's also a, a delivery vehicle. Yeah? It provides you with food, but it also some of these chemistries enable you to absorb things into your bloodstream that you probably wouldn't normally absorb. That's how complicated food is. It's a very, very complicated scenario. So you know, good luck trying to get to the bottom of that in three years. Uh, so it'll, it'll go on, you know, sometime, sometime in a hundred years we'll have it all figured out. Um, I got the impression from your talk that uh, chocolate is difficult to cultivate, and I was wondering what it was about it, if you could explain, um, that hinders uh, industrialization, if that has to do with the uh, price going up. It is, it is relatively difficult to cultivate, that's, that's very true. Uh, in part, it's because, unfortunately, it's very prone to, to pathogens and pests. Uh, cocoa is a very, has a high sensitivity to uh, uh, f uh, essentially fungi. Um, they're somewhat symbiotic. Uh, you can imagine this is a very humid, hot environment, not like, not like Seattle, not like humid cold. Uh, uh, humid, humid, hot. And this material is, um, uh, has a tendency to mold very, very easily. Um, entire countries have been wiped out. So, I mean, uh, the country of Brazil uh, lost a large amount of its coca crop to, uh, to uh, various fungal pests. Uh, the country of Costa Rica, you know, fairly recent years, 1980s and the 1980s, 1990s, ma had most of its coca crop wiped out. Uh, either by manilia or one of those related fungal pathogens. The Ivory Coast crop uh, it, this year and last year has uh, been suffering from uh, significant problems with black pod and a couple of other um, related fungal pathogens, witches, broom, and so on and so forth. These are all just fungi fancy, funky names for different types of of fungal pathogens that affect cocoa. Unfortunately, it's very hard to treat uh, the material that's been affected. And the, the, the effect of one of these uh, uh, infections on the cocoa crop is absolutely catastrophic. So the Ivory Coast crop has dropped by about 20%. Okay, we're talking a national crop. We're talking 70% of the world's cocoa. Uh, that's where it comes from the Ivory Coast and about 20% of their crop has, has, has completely failed and that's because they've got pathogen problems. It's a very, very hard uh, uh, hard uh, crop to cultivate, I would say, and it doesn't lend itself well to industrialization, which is, you know, you can sort of intensively grow it, um, but it requires an awful lot of uh, uh, chemistry to keep the thing alive if you want to do it that way. It's really a crop that grows quite well in natural circumstance, but then it doesn't yield a great deal of fruit, and so there's this sort of dichotomy that goes on in the cocoa industry as they try and push the crop yield higher. Does that answer your question? Thank you. I was wondering if there's a chemical similarity between like red wines, because when I have a nice piece of dark chocolate, the feeling in my mouth is similar to also after having some nice red wine. Is there chemical similarities that would cause that s reaction? There are. There are. Uh, so there are chemical, uh, there are shared chemistries between red wine and chocolate. Yay. Uh, so, 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 so uh, 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 the... Um, uh, the flavonol groups, there are flavonols, not flavanols, a slight difference in chemistry, but some of the antioxidants that exist in red wine, you can also find in chocolate. Uh, they're not the ones that I showed earlier on. Those are, those are ones that predominate in chocolate, but some of the ones that are at a lower level, uh, you can also find in red wine, and they're the ones that people get very excited about in red wine. So, And those are the ones that, again, impart flavor. 
So some of those flavors that you're picking up that are coming from the antioxidants in red wine, you can also pick up in chocolate. Uh, it was just recently described. It was found about 18 months ago or two years ago. People messing around with chocolate and trying to figure out what's in there. Fun stuff. Oh, yep. I have a very similar question about wine. Is it is it vintage like grapes is in, in that... Mm -hmm. um, Chocolate sure. So uh, the question was uh, uh, asking about uh, different types of vintages and are there vintages of chocolate? The answer is yes. Um, chocolate is a, a, a biannual crop, so um, twice a year. The crop goes through what's called a major harvest and a minor harvest. The, the crops are all staggered depending on different parts of the world, and in fact there are some places where they can pretty much crop throughout the year. But generally speaking, there are two crops a year. The major and the minor crops have different flavor characteristics. So you can find uh, uh, slightly different flavor characteristics and from year to year you'll get different flavor characteristics as well. And this can be measured at everything from a very subtle flavor level to, to more macro things like the quality of the chemical quality of the cocoa butter which is a big thing for the cocoa industry. So for instance a few years ago there was a big problem in Indonesia where Basically, essentially, adverse weather was 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 you know counterindicated, not particularly good for the cocoa crop, and so there was a, a, a decline in the quality of the the, the the cocoa butter. And so, yes, there are effects um, uh, in the area of trying to find high quality cocoa beans. Yes, very much so. You'll find different vintages, but nobody's really done a sort of uh, you know uh, uh, year to year sort of you know what, what would this be a 2010 vintage chocolate bar yet. Be an interesting thing to try. Uh, actually, a lady that works here had a question for you, and it was, "How do you feel about bacon-flavored chocolate?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I often wondered how I how I would approach this with a rabbi, because um, we actually we actually have a, a <laughs> we actually have a, a, a part of the factory that's quite clearly clearly identified as kosher, and I didn't really want to do this. Um, so we we don't actually make bacon-flavored chocolate. Um, there is another company that has tried this, and I think they're very brave. And actually, I believe it's been quite successful. And so um, I would say that there are very, very interesting things that you can combine chocolate with in terms of flavor that you might not have thought of. So uh, yes, bacon does work with chocolate. And uh, we've done some interesting things. We've done uh, white chocolate lobster bisque. Uh, all sorts of interesting savory pairings. So I encourage you to explore that. There's lots of interesting ways that chocolate flavors uh, work in, in, in more savory types of uh, non-dessert uh, types of food. Um, you mentioned in the factory being able to taste 100% cacao. And I noticed when I'm buying chocolate, it's only like 50, 55, 60% maximum. Uh -huh. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, it's uh, so. So if you come to our factory, you can taste. Uh, let's see, in the store is ninety-one percent. So uh, that that sort of, sort of takes it up there. Nearly the lowest percentage dark chocolate that we actually make is a seventy percent. We don't go any lower than that. Um, and uh, we sell some eighty-four percent, some higher octane stuff. Uh, the hundred percent stuff is 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 quite an acquired taste. And I would recommend anyone. And there are some chocolate makers that have done a successful job. Uh, there's some European small, very small European artisan brands that have, that have made these types of uh, chocolates, and we're also working on them. Uh, 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 but it's very, very difficult. There's no room for error. You can't, you can't just add a little sugar. It's uh, very, very narrow working parameters that you have. So the roast has to be absolutely perfect. It's quite a challenging thing to do. But believe it or not, straight ground cocoa nibs done well with great cacao can taste really outstanding. It's a really, really special thing to try, especially if it's in a liquid form. The solid bar's a bit much. Is the uh, cocoa butter still removed and sold for other purposes because of its higher value in other industries and therefore replaced with um, other fats? Yeah, it is. Uh, so cocoa butter is about, uh, some just, just to use some very ballparky numbers, somewhere around 350 to $5 a pound, and uh, other fats, you know, 50 cents a pound. So it's very, very tempting if you're trying to make a cheap chocolate bar to remove some of that cocoa butter and either replace it with a lot of lecithin, in other words, a bit of, a bit of uh, food lube, uh, or um, uh, doesn't, doesn't that makes you want to eat the stuff, doesn't it? <laughs> Look, look at how many products contain soy. Uh, anyone who's allergic to soy will tell you, but it's um, astounding. 
Um, uh, but it's very, very tempting to replace that and sell that material on into other industries, yes. So it is frequently done. Uh, it doesn't help the cocoa farmer who's trying to make some, you know, trying to make some material unless, unless they're trying to do something that's very specifically targeted for cocoa butter. We have a question from someone back by the bar. Um, what are the bacteria that are largely responsible for the fermentation of chocolate? And do different bacteria produce different results in terms of taste, as is the case with cheese or beer? Absolutely. So uh, it's a complex uh, reaction. It's a three-step reaction. So it starts with uh, yeast colonization. And so we have something that looks like this with some gooey white snot all over it, which is the mucilage. Doesn't that, does it, sorry, I didn't mean to put everyone <laughs> off their chocolate. Um, so imagine, uh, let, me, let me try a different analogy. Imagine the inside of a melon and uh, that, that sort of slimy stuff that's very, very sweet. Uh, the yeast love this. It's a, it's a very high, uh, a rich source in sugar. So the cocoa beans are first colonized by yeast. They then start a conversion, a very rapid conversion of that sugar into alcohols. Those, those alcohols are then converted into lactic acid by lactobacilli. So the same type of uh, bugs that you might find in a cheese fermentation. So we start with something that looks like a wine fermentation. We very rapidly have some lactobacilli. And while that's going on very rapidly, we then have acetic acid bacteria come in and colonize that material. They start converting whatever they can get hold of, and they'll convert that into acetic acid. And so there's a very, very complete fermentation cycle that takes place here. Maybe if it's helpful, if you think of something like kimchi or something like this, something that's gone through a very, very extensive fermentation. The other thing that's kind of cool is the fermentation of the cocoa gets really, really hot. So this is a biological fermentation reaction. Those cocoa um, uh, piles will actually hit about 46 degrees Celsius, which in a biological reaction is phenomenally hot. So we, we have a process that's a little bit like silage or something like that. It's an extremely intense process to take those cocoa seeds and transform them from some vile tasting purple seed, which they really do. If you ever tried one, they, they don't taste that great. Uh, all the way through to a finished uh, to a finished cocoa bean, and it's one of it's quite illuminating to look at this and think, no wonder it took so bloody long to go from cocoa beans as a crop all the way through to finished chocolate bars. No wonder it took three thousand years, because uh, if you look at the starting material, it's an awfully long way from the finished product. So um, I had a, I had a quick question about. Uh, the, the tempering process you uh, sure uh, you mentioned that it's it you crystallize the the chocolate and I'm wondering if so I, I've gone through many steps of uh, just making stovetop chocolate bars and uh, through through my uh, toils I've never been able to make uh, a bar that actually tastes like it, it like a real chocolate bar that you get from from Theo's for example uh, they all end up extremely hard and brittle oh. and, and it's it's uh, it's all I make tree bark out of it so I put nuts in there to kind of soften it up a little bit but uh, <laughs> yes um, so t so tempering really the, the the easiest way to home temper and you can it's quite difficult but you can actually make uh, chocolate home and you can certainly temper at home you need to find yourself a nice thick stone slab uh, you, the room temperature somewhere between 60, around 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I'm jumping between units. I'm British. I'm very confused about imperial and metric. I'm Canadian, sorry. Oh, okay. So there we go. So, <laughs> so yeah, so it's about, you know, three feet high and about 50, 50 milliliters, yeah. Uh, so, so, um, so what we're, we're, we're trying to do here is we want to, we want to take that uh, 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 chocolate to about uh, 29 degrees Celsius, uh, centigrade uh, in, a, in a room on a stone slab that's in a room with an ambient temperature of 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and, and, basically, and basically take a, like a, a, a nice big uh, 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 trowel that you would use for sort of doing grout work. Please, please wash it before you use it for chocolate. Um, and scoop this stuff around the table. And you want to keep going. Basically, the first time you should do it, you should just keep going until it sets. The second time you do it, you want to move this material around until it looks like the viscosity has definitely changed and the gloss will change as well. And you'll get used to seeing this. And then as you're moving this material around, all of a sudden, you've got a very short period of time in which to add this 
uh, uh, slow, uh, sorry, rapidly crystallizing chocolate into a mold and get this material sort of set up. Uh, the other alternative is to seed another container, but it is possible to temper chocolate. And we actually, we go through, periodically we do classes, we actually teach people how to temper chocolate. Uh, milk chocolate gets much more difficult. The milk fat in the chocolate means that the tempering temperature is lower, it's much closer to the point where it's actually setting up. You've got to be more on the ball, but it's, it's kind of a thing. You've got to keep the thing uh, moving. It's got to look very elegant, a little, a little like that lady in Chocolat, that lovely French movie, you know, with a sort of, you know, with a, with a beautiful sens sensual uh, 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 sort of chocolate and on the table with a nice lighting. Yeah. Yeah, that's the aphrodisiac. Yes, yes, that's, 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 that's required. Yeah, that's probably, that's probably what's missing in your kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> So you talk about organic and fair trade. How do you oversee knowing that the main ingredient, the cocoa beans, come from foreign countries? How do you make sure that everything is truly organic? Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, the short answer is we go there. So, so th this is a, a, a multi-step process. It's audited. Uh, we keep an eye on things. We also test the material. But bottom line, really, the very simple, the simple process is to start the process by actually going to the farm, meeting these guys, spending some time with them, uh, frankly, keeping your eyes peeled and making sure that there's nothing that's unusual or untoward. And, and, and you'll, you, one tends to find with these groups that if they're truly organic, they sort of, they have a, they have a mindset about doing everything. There's, there's just not a, uh, 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 sort of a, a, a impetus to use uh, chemicals in their process. Uh, so they know a lot about uh, preserving their topsoil and doing all sorts of various types of things that are required to, to handle that material in an organic way. And often there's just no economic impetus either. So, so if you're dealing with these smallholder farms and small co-ops, they have always been, in the, for the most part, they have always been organic. There are some larger places that are mixed. In those places, then they have very clear audit trails. And these places are audited by third parties. One of the things that we believe in very, very strongly is that if we're going to buy and we're going to stick by the principles of organic and fair trade um, certification, that that certification process has to be done by a third party. We have to go in there. We have to be satisfied that everything's cool and kosher with no bacon, etc. But we also need to make sure uh, and, and have a third party do that as well, whose expertise is in that particular area. So that's sort of how we address it. Um, but ultimately, it's sort of a mixture of both. Does that answer the question? Hi. Um, I recently discovered single origin chocolates, where the beans from one region taste different than the beans from another. And I'm really astonished by your Madagascar chocolate. It has a real um, tart, citrusy taste that you don't get from other regions. Um, but I've noticed that some of your other chocolates from other regions do have a little bit of a tartness that I don't find in uh, other chocolates from other manufacturers in the same regions. I wonder if you would share how you achieve that. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things going on. Um, uh, so Madagascar, well, Madagascar is a very unusual cocoa bean. It's, it's a it uh, produces some very fruity floral notes. Uh, it's, it's really sort of, um, it's really an unusual uh, uh, type, of, uh, 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 type of starting material. Uh, we also use some other beans as well. We use a fair amount of Dominican Republic cacao. And that Dominican Republic also has some fairly strong fruit notes. And they tend to predominate into the finished chocolate bar. Um, some of it is intentional. Some of it is we're learning, and we're learning how to become very good chocolate makers. And along that process, we, we, we sort of experiment a bit. And I'm aware of that. We, a we actually have made some bars that we're probably a little bit too fruity at times. Um, but there's sort of a balance. We're trying, to, we're trying to come up with a chocolate that tastes very chocolatey but has a, bright, a brightness to it. And so there's a sort of a balancing act going on here. And so we've, we've put together a couple of different blends. We're actually using a blend of Dominican Republic and Ecuadorian cacao right now that's really working for us. And, and some of that fruitiness is coming from the Dominican Republic cacao. But we're also looking at other origins and working with some other groups. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes. It, it's, it's sort of an interesting experiment. Cocoa and chocolate's a very subjective thing, so. 
So you spoke about the Swiss process by which a lot of the acetic acid and I'm guessing some of the higher order fermentation products are consumed and reduced. Would you talk a little bit about the chemistry of uh, how that happens, the mechanisms by which that happens, and what sort of the products of that chemistry are? Well, the, sh the, the, the short answer is it's quite complicated. So we, we spent last Friday with, a, with a, a gas chromatography mass spec stuck into the lid of our, a lid of our conching unit, um, trying to figure out what, um, what, con what is actually going on. Um, what we can see, are, are it's rather confusing. So we have small, simple acids being released, things like acetic acid, lactic acid, very simple, small acids. Uh, that you would expect to find the fermentation process being released. At the same time as that is going on, there's uh, also more of more simple acids are also being generated. And they're being generated because when we slow cook that material, when we conch, we take that mass up above 80 degrees Celsius, and that starts to kick off some, some extra degradation reactions. So those extra degradation reactions will generate more material and that extra material that's generated sort of then sort of goes around in a circle. So there's a lot of complicated stuff going on. The long and the short answer is nobody really knows. Uh, that's why we've got some very fancy analytical equipment in there, and we're trying to figure it out. And I'm, you know, we're, we're, we're privileged to be able to sort of access some, some, some tools in the, some of the idle time. And when, it, when some of these technologies are not being used, we're able to get a little time on these machines and actually look at these specific issues. You know, uh, what, what, what makes different cocoa beans from different areas smell different? What sort of properties are conducive to good chocolate? And also what goes on during the processing? And that's something that we're actively engaged in at Thea and having quite a lot of fun with, actually. We have another question from back by the bar. Um, how are the antioxidants in chocolate uh, similar to certain vitamins like vitamin C or vitamin E or selenium? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's some, there was a suggestion about two years ago to call the antioxidants in chocolate v another vitamin. What are we, vitamin K, L, whatever, I don't know. Um, I couldn't decide how much of that was branding and how much was the, w was, was the word vitamin. Vitamin implies that it's ne necessary for life. And yes, antioxidants are necessary for life, but there's lots of different types of them. So which type do you need to survive? That's not clear. Do these antioxidants in chocolate have a beneficial effect? Yes. Do you need, will you die without them? Probably not. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know, there's, a, there's, there's, there's I, think, I think I calculated that, that it takes something like 30 tons a second or something to feed the world's population on chocolate, and that far exceeds the entire annual crop cocoa crop by about 250,000 times. So there's lots of people that don't consume any sorts of chocolate in their life and they're fine. So I think that's a bit of a contrived, contrived issue with trying to use the word vitamin. However, having said that, there is definitely something that's in chocolate that's good for you and valid that has an effect. But whether one would call that a vitamin or not, ah, I don't know. That's really just how you label things. Oh. I read somewhere, somewhere on the internet that uh, somebody produced chocolate that doesn't melt on hot weather. Can you tell more about that? And is this really chocolate? It, uh, doesn't, it doesn't have a what? doesn't melt on hot weather. weather. Oh, yes. Um, actually, funny, funny story. So, so, so the, the, the U.S. Army has been trying this for years, right? Think about, think about M&Ms, melt in your mouth, not in your hand, right? So, so candy-covered chocolate, blah, blah, blah. And so... There, there was more interest in can we make a chocolate bar without all the hard coating that doesn't, doesn't melt. And the answer is, well, yes, you can. You can do this very easily. You don't need any chemistry. You just mix a thing with corn flour, and it tastes bloody revolting. Um, <laughs> so you can mix it. You can add flour, which is good, because now technically that won't be a, won't be a candy product under the Washington <laughs> state law, and uh, uh, technically not subject to the candy tax. Uh, but and it won't melt in your hand because it's full of corn flour. Um, and that's, that's been one of the techniques that's been tried. And, and my understanding, with a little bit of insider knowledge, is that it is possible to make these things, but they taste quite vile. And so I would say that, yes, people have succeeded in making something that melts, but they gave away the good flavor properties and some of the things that, that people imagine. 
just imagine mixing corn flour with chocolate and then putting it in your mouth. It's, it doesn't, I mean, just even the thought of it doesn't, doesn't exactly sort of strike, uh, strike a note of confidence there. So. Yeah, of the effects of chocolate on children. Well, I think I think uh, it depends a little bit on uh, what their diet is and what they're used to. So, I mean, with that caveat, okay, but there's a couple of things to remember. Um, again, depending on the type of chocolate that you're feeding the kids, what 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 is in that? I mean, what is the percentage of cocoa in there? What other stuff is in there? Are you feeding them essentially a recycled soy product? What are you actually feeding them? With all of those caveats removed, and let's say you feed them good chocolate, the only concern really is that there is a fair amount of sugar in there, and there's also theobromine, a stimulant. Okay, so it's a bit like giving them a, a, a little bit something like sweet coffee. So they're going to get quite wound up. They, they, they like it. So we have tours of kids that come through the factory, <laughs> and, and um, maybe they've seen Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, and and, and it gets awfully loud uh, uh, towards the end of the tours. Uh, they get very excitable, and there's lots of noise and screaming. And, you know, and I, I came past a school group today, and there was 100 kids pouring out of the chocolate factory, and they were, they were really bouncy. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an active food stuff, like many other things. Uh, if you were to feed them lots of uh, pudding or dessert, they'll do similar sorts of things. I think my only opinion is... And, and perhaps uh, to look at it from a parent's point of view is to feed, uh, to, to know what you're giving your kids and just to understand that it is a mild stimulant, yes. Uh, is it a super strong stimulant? No, it's not. It's not like giving them, you know, it's not like giving them 10 cups of espresso, but it is a mild stimulant. It does have an effect. You mentioned uh, vintages and auditing. How do you ensure quality and how do you ensure consistency for your production line? Yeah, so uh, quality is quite an interesting thing. We're actually working very actively on that with the University of Washington. So trying to use some modern technologies to measure the quality of cocoa beans. One of the challenges uh, in any sort of artisan food space is how do you capture the essence of good taste and describe that to a third party. You may have somebody that has a really good nose. You may have someone that has an extremely developed palate, but anyone can imagine that if somebody has an extremely developed palate, the last thing they want to be uh, want to have done to them is to be locked in the room and be told they have to sample a hundred things a day consistently. It's sort of their worst nightmare come true. So, one of the things that we're interested in doing is trying to develop technologies to assist with that process. That's not to say replace. I don't think you can replace humans because I think there are so many aspects to food that technology, as it currently stands in 2010, can't replace. But there are things that some of these novel technologies can help us with in, in, in sort of trying to, to measure uh, some of the broader measurements of good and bad. So uh, the current techniques essentially for assessing cocoa quality are to cut the beans in half, to look at the color and the consistency of the, of the cut fragments of the cocoa beans. Basically, we cut them right down the middle along the long axis here. And we're going to look at the color of that and, the, and, the, and, the, and essentially the shape and make some conclusions about that. And then the rest of it is very, as they say, organoleptic. In other words, you sniff it and you taste it and then you try, often in vain, to describe this flavor to someone else using some standardized criteria. And this works relatively well as long as you have a small set of samples. If you have you know, a metric ton of chocolate, it's quite difficult to go through a metric ton and then try and describe that in some meaningful manner. So there's a sort of a, a, a balancing act between trying to do something in an artisan manner and trying to sort of quantitate it with technology. But I think first and foremost, we need to understand that humans are much more sophisticated than machines certainly can ever be right now, certainly right, right at this particular time, and that we need to do a lot more uh, sort of development work around how one smells and tastes things and how one correlates that to what a, what a machine tells us. So we're just trying that right now. We just, we spent, actually that was last Friday and tomorrow we'll be doing some more of this type of work. And it's very, very illuminating. So certain types of equipment have very, very specific skills. They can tell us about the flavor and the potential qualities of the chocolate, but they can't tell us everything we need to know. You can't replace humans yet, thank God. Yeah, we we try to we try to um, it's 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 a you know 
th th there's, there's a level of, of humanity to what we're trying to do. So we're, we're, we're sort of torn between, we're trying to be somewhat consistent, so within one batch it's quite consistent. But there's, a, there's sort of two things tearing at us. One is that we're trying to sort of push the frontier and really make very, very extraordinary chocolate. And that means that some batches turn out really well and some of them, they're not as good. Um, so we, we try and sort of cut, uh, sort of work out how to navigate through this, this, this complex space. And we've got better at it, certainly. And so we're, we're spending a lot of energy trying to figure out how to sort of develop our chocolate making process. And the result of that is that it tastes slightly different. So I would say, with, as with any artisan manufacturer, you're going to see differences, and I, to some extent, would welcome those. Because even if we had a highly consistent process, the starting material should vary. So if it's a major crop or a minor crop, or year to year, the weather's different, we're going to see different types of cocoa developing, we're going to see different flavors. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity to reverse things and say, listen, you know, we don't want the McDonald's experience. I don't want consistency. I accept some level of variation. I don't, I don't want it to taste awful, but at the same time, you know, I'd like some variation in my food. It's, it's, you know what I mean? So I think, I think, you know, yay for quality management and yay for all of these sort of, you know, Six Sigma things that, that you know, are very boring. Um, but, but, but I also think that it behooves an artisan manufacturer to sort of explore the outer limits of what of what can be made with, with, with chocolate or wine or coffee or what have you, and have some fun with it. I think that's, that's an important part of the mission. What are some of the, the most important factors when it comes to the f what develops the flavor of the chocolate? And I'm asking sort of from the consumer point of view. So that other guy likes a bright citrusy flavor, yep. and I like a darker sort of a berry flavor. So if we're staring at the rack of quality chocolate bars, how can we know, based on what we like, how to pick something to try? I, I think I think that's quite difficult. Even if you wrote the word "tasty" on the outside, it wouldn't it wouldn't inform us really. <laughs> and 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 you know, some people get on the back of the the wrapper and they say, you know, with overtones of cherry and oak. Uh, come on, I mean, you know, I I think I think ultimately you have to try some. And and one of the reasons why. We, we got into this, and one of the reasons why we pass samples around is w we believe in, in, in okay, it's, it's, it's a bit of an artisan process. We'd like people to try this material out and, and sort of inform their buying choice based on what they, what they tasted. So we don't advertise. We don't do a lot of other things that, that sort of larger companies will tend to do to drive sales. What we do is we go out and give free chocolate out. And then people say, hey, listen, I tried these five things. I like four of them. And the fifth one, I, I, I didn't like it. I don't want to eat that. Um, and so I think that's part of it. And I, 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 th I think, uh, uh, you know, the Madagascar is an interesting example. It's one that, that, that initially I, I had not particularly liked. And now I've sort of grown, grown to sort of develop a taste for this particular chocolate. And it's also, we've also changed some of the processes associated with how we roast that, that particular cocoa bean. And we've been able to develop and bring out different flavors. So there's a lot going on. It's a very complicated starting material. There are over 400 major chemical species in there that you can easily pick up with a decent liquid chromatography mass spec. And so when we do some roasting on this and we do some chemistry, we see lots of different types of flavor possibilities. And it's really quite a struggle to sort of tease these out. It, it becomes a, a, a real sort of hands-on experience. I think it's very hard to judge what a flavor is just by looking at a wrapper. I think you have to buy the product, test the product, and then if you like it, buy more. If you don't like it, well, that's fine. It's a subjective kind of thing. Okay, we have time for one more quick question. Uh, I've got a question for you. Does chocolate have any medicinal value or use? Has chocolate entered the field of medicine? There's, uh, there's uh, an interesting, there's actually an interesting review article, I believe it's called uh, Chocolate as Medicine, and there's there's uh, uh, written texts that go back to 15, you know, 1500 on this. I mean, it starts with Hernando Cortez, and then it actually gets into the medical, you know, the medical community. Whatever you, <coughs> I mean, it was a little bit different back in 1600. Okay, but 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 th they at least wrote things down, and and you can see this progression uh, and fascination over the potential health benefits of chocolate. I think the challenge, um, the challenge is is. Uh, with chocolate is yes it does have some interesting properties but in what context is it being consumed and with what else and what is it being diluted with and what is the particular what are the particular properties of uh, one chocolate from one manufacturer 
versus one from another. So we know, for instance, when we look at our chocolate and we do some uh, very uh, standard sort of antioxidant measurement uh, uh, measurements on our chocolate, our chocolate antioxidant values are extremely high. I don't know why. Um, there's nothing that we intended uh, uh, when we did our, our the, the, when we built the process the way we built the process, but it happens to have that property. Um, it's it's just one of these interesting things that you can uh, sort of look at. There are lots of interesting effects of chocolate. Um, the FDA and typically venture capitalists don't like this because there isn't a specific chemical entity that they can synthesize in a in a in a in a test tube or some re large reactor and say, okay, it's this one molecule, it's got to be this, but rather it's a complicated mix of things, of which some of them are probably helping move other active biological molecules into your bloodstream. So it's a very complicated mix. So it's quite hard to sort of um, uh, think of it in a sort of classic medicinal, Western medicinal sense. It sort of has this sort of older, you know, more sort of ethereal property to it. Um, and there's lots of people trying think, to, to push it from a, you know, everything from a sort of hardcore health push to, listen, this is just an interesting food stuff with an interesting property. And we're sort of somewhere in the, in the sort of middle surveying this space, figuring out there's all this noise on the left screaming about the health benefits of chocolate. And yes, but there's definitely some validity to that. And we're over here on the right saying, but also it's a very nice food. So interesting combination. I don't know the answer. I think it's going to shake itself out. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a discussion that's been going on for five, six centuries now. <laughs>